is Peter Kukowski. And I'm the Director of Academic and Public Programs at the Cantor Arts Center. Although we can't be in the building and on campus, the Cantor team continues to pursue our mission of presenting and interpreting art. And today we are delighted to launch the exhibition Aura, Art and Authenticity on our website, museum.stanford.edu. When you go there to learn more about this exhibition, including details about a number of objects, which Eric will not discuss this evening, you will find additional resources on our Museums from Home and our Learning from Home pages, which will be continuing to expand in the coming weeks. The exhibition Aura is possible because of a generous grant from the Mellon Foundation that enables us to select two PhD candidates in art history at Stanford to develop focused exhibitions each year. Working with their academic advisors and the Cantor's education, curatorial, and exhibition teams, the students engage in the research and practical considerations that combine to form an exhibition. Our presenter tonight, Eric Yingling, came to Stanford with a degree from Brigham Young University, uh, majoring in ancient Near Eastern studies and his master's in liturgical studies from the Yale Divinity School. His work here at Stanford focuses on images material culture and religion in late antiquity and the Middle Ages. His presentation tonight will last about 20 minutes, following which he will be joined by Patrick Crowley, the new Associate Curator of European Art at the Cantor. Patrick joins us today from Chicago, but we're hoping we can get him out to California as soon as possible. Eric and Patrick will take questions from all of you. So if you have any questions during or after the talk, please submit them using the chat function in Zoom. And now it's my pleasure to welcome to the screen, Eric Yingling. Make sure this is one. All right, thank you, Peter. And thank you for all of you for joining us this evening. Aura Art and Authenticity explores the question, what makes a work of art authentic? And when is a fake truly a fake? It takes its inspiration from the critic Walter Benjamin, who argued that the authenticity of a work of art was inextricable from what he called the aura, or the perception of its original presence. He wrote, even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element, its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be. This unique existence of the work of art determined the history to which it was subject throughout time and its existence. This includes the changes which it may have suffered in physical condition over the years, as well as the various changes in ownership. The presence of the original is the prerequisite to the concept of authenticity. Yet questions about authenticity become puzzling when we consider how some works of art change over time or when they do not fit neatly into categories such as ancient, modern, original copy, genuine, or fake. Consider this mummy coffin in the Cantor Art Center. And here I'd like to credit Kevin Chappelle for this excellent sketch. It gives you kind of a vision of what uh, the exhibition will look like to a certain degree uh, on the second floor. Now this mummy coffin has a very interesting his history. In October 1888, Richard H. Plummer, a professor of anatomy at the Cooper Medical College in San Francisco, left for an adventurous year-long sabbatical. For 25 years, he had dreamt of exploring the world like Phileas Fogg, the fictional character from the novel Around the World in 80 Days. His own trip followed Fogg's footsteps in reverse order, from San Francisco to Yokohama, Hong Kong, Singapore, Calcutta, Bombay, the Gulf of Suez, Paris, London, New York, and back home again. Along the way, he braved storms in the Pacific, rode elephants in India, and fell under the spell of Egypt's wonders. It was during the spring 
likely March or possibly April, that Professor Plummer purchased this mummy coffin for a chantress, that's a singer in the temple of Amun, which he gifted to his home institution upon his return. Uh, later, the Cooper Medical College then bequeathed it to the Leland Stanford Junior Museum in 1913. It is now a centerpiece of the Cantor's antiquities collection. It is likely that somewhere along this journey that this coffin's appearance was heavily modified. In fact, one Egyptologist, Barbara Thompson, estimated that up to 70 to 80 percent of the coffin's exterior has been uh, reconstructed, overpainted, and varnished to appeal to Western tastes. Uh, and this is all done uh, in modern times. Yet much of this coffin is still ancient. As, um, as another example, such as this one from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, we see a floral collar in both examples right here. And if you look, you see the, the hands are in similar positions. Uh, and then if we move to the legs, there are these winged goddesses on the legs and scarab beetles as well. This is sort of standard iconography for this time period. Occasionally, though not in this particular example from the Met, you also have uh, a vulture's headdress, the wings of a vulture's headdress that extend from the head down to the neck. Now normally such features smooth smoothly slope into one another. But in the case of the Cantor's coffin, someone has radically carved back the area around the face, chiseled out the lotus bangs like a royal crown, and painted the shadowy vulture's headdress into a chic bob-like haircut. That's up here. Likely what we see here, I argue, is a 19th century vision of Cleopatra, as exemplified in the French painter Alexandre Cabanel's 1887 painting, Cleopatra Testing Poisons on Condemned Prisoners. It's a detail so you don't see the, the prisoners. But in the painting, Cleopatra's face is soft and round. Her eyes are lined black. Shadowy bangs cascade toward the eyes. A crown settles at the brow and golden wings curve behind the chin, anticipating the bob hairstyles of many modern visions of Cleopatra. Just below her chest, we see a striped fabric band, red, black, and gold, it's here, that dives down the torso until it reaches the belt. From waist to ankles, her dress is a kaleidoscope of color and Egyptian-esque symbols. It is likely that Professor, it is telling that Professor Plummer arrived in the city of Paris with his mummy coffin in May of 1889, during the years when Cabanel's 1887 vision of Cleopatra was pleasing Parisian eyes with her decadence. In the end, the Cantor's coffin appears to be what I call an authentic hoax, an object that blurs the boundaries between antiquity, modernity, authenticity, and forgery. We cannot accept Cleopatra's beauty as entirely ancient, but we also cannot dismiss this coffin as an outright fraud. Another object that is purported to be from Egypt is this ring, which is shaped like a scarab beetle on the backside. Just before his untimely death, the young Leland Stanford Jr. acquired this object in Paris in 1884. The ring's history had nearly been forgotten, but an old water-stained letter, probably inked in Jane Stanford's hand, offers clues about the ring's origins. It captures the words of Leland's hieroglyphic tutor, the Egyptologist, George Darisy, who certified the ring's authenticity. What we see in the letter, it's, it says that the ring is inscribed with the name Rama Neb, or the Egyptian pharaoh Amenhotep IV, uh, who is said to have reigned in four, 1407 BC. Amenhotep IV was also known as Akhenaten, the famous pharaoh who, who changed Egyptian religion from polytheism to monotheistic worship of the sun disk, Aten, and who radically altered Egyptian artistic style so that figures appeared more organic and flexible. 
This discovery must have struck Leland's imagination like lightning. Leland's posthumous biography written by Herbert, Herbert C. Nash describes the boy's enthusiasm. We find him in the Louvre with, quote, notebook and pencil in hand, obsessively copying the hieroglyphics of scarabs, the signets of the pharaohs, and the signs of the different dynasties. His curiosity had been awakened, and Nash writes, quote, curiosity has this in common with our passions. Once awakened, nothing will satisfy them. In truth, the ring never mentions Ramanep. Instead, the inscription reads, P Ma'at. And you can see that here, uh, right here with the, the box sign makes a P sound, and then we have the feather and the upside down, or the loaf of bread's upside down half circle. This is Ma'at. So you have P Ma'at. So Ma'at was a real Egyptian goddess, and it's interesting that the scarab scroll-like design does actually recall ancient patterns from around 2050 to 1550 BCE. But talking with Egyptologists, this inscription seems grammatically nonsensical. So there are two possible answers to this riddle. One, the scarab might be a genuine antiquity that preserves a scribal error. And this is a possibility that's not without precedent. Or two, it might simply be a fake. In support of the latter, we do know that Leland's deep pockets and naivete made him a magnet for con artists in the Parisian antiquities markets. It's a very interesting account in, in Nash's biography of Leland entering these antiquities markets in Paris and going back and forth with the dealers. This is what Nash writes. He says, quote, Leland could distinguish the real from the spurious almost as easily as the dealers themselves. So he was just one step behind. But then he writes, quote, it frequently happened that, Le that looking over specimens offered him for sale, Leland would hand back some to the dealer, quietly remarking that they were imitations. And invariably the man, after a look at his young customer, would apologize, excusing himself on the ground that the imitations had accidentally slipped in with the others. So the question is, is this ring one of those imitations that has accidentally slipped in, uh, that Leland didn't quite catch? We cannot absolutely be cer certain in this instance um, if it's a fake or not. As T.G. Wakeling wrote in his 1912 book, Forged Egyptian Antiquities, quote, you know, my dear fellow, it, is almost, it has become almost impossible to tell fakes from originals, for these things are made by the descendants of those men who made the originals. Other fakes are easier to discern. Consider this relief of a warrior. It is full of anachronisms and stereotypes, including an exaggerated Roman nose, an arm and hand that are way too stiff to be stylistically accurate. See that right here. And here's my favorite. On the breastplate, we expect to see the shoulder strap attached to the pectoral right there, but instead what we find is it swoops right underneath the armpit. Uh, so even the stone's aging is questionable. Its bright rust-colored hues diverge from the more muted patinas of authentic reliefs that have spent centuries in the earth or out in the, out in the rain. Lastly, if you look at the places where the stone has supposedly broken, eh, they just so happen to form the, match the figural composition, moving around at a right angle right here with the arm following the helm. All these conclusions lead to the, all these details lead to the conclusion that this relief is not genuine. We can compare this relief to one that is authentic and is also found in the Cantor, a Syrian funerary relief of a woman dating to the second century CE. Here the face is stained with a duller shade of brown. Look, you can see that here, it's aged. Um, and if you look carefully, you can see a lighter streak going down the right eye, probably indicating that centuries of rainwater tended to run down the face through the divots in the hair and over the eye. That would be right here, that's where the stain is. 
Of course, there's also a difference between a fake and a copy. In certain cultural settings, the perception of an image's presence is not determined by artistic originality. For instance, this 17th century icon of the Virgin and Child imitates a famous Russian Orthodox icon called the Vladimir Mother of God, 12th century icon. Uh, the Cantor's icon is this one here on the right. In the image, we see the Christ child and his mother embrace in a way that many parents of young children likely know from experience. Mary puts her arm underneath her child. He raises his arms and tries to latch onto her neck. They feel each other's warmth as their cheeks grace one another. Now this image's imitation of a sacred prototype likely did not diminish its aura in the minds of believers, as can be seen from the inscriptions on the front and the back. Both texts endow the image with prestige and power. They tell us that this icon is capable of working miracles and conferring blessings upon children, and that it was passed down through generations of Russian nobles, including the descendants of Andrei Bogoyupsky, the very man who is said to have brought the sacred prototype to Russia in the 12th century. In ages past, the magic of this icon was also summoned through its use. As believers held candles before it, its golden ground would likely flicker in the sacred gloom, animating the icon with the presence of the divine. There are also differences between fakes and facsimiles. In our own era, we often think of facsimiles as precise copies of an artifact or work of art. But in the 19th century, facsimiles could also involve creative acts of artistic restoration. Consider, for instance, this image of a seated woman with a book in her hand. It is a facsimile of an ancient figurine from the Greek city of Tanagra, which Jane Stanford acquired at an unknown date. So far, the image of the writerly woman has not been definitively identified, but I argue in the exhibition catalog that 19th century viewers likely perceived her to be Karina, the famous Greek poet from Tanagra, who is said to have outshone her male colleagues in poetry competitions and artistic portraits even celebrated her victories in antiquity. Karina was, according to Mary F. Curtis's 1879 description, quote, the pride and glory of the Tanagra people. Every schoolgirl invokes Karina for her secret rhymes and may yet do so for her college day class exercises. We are in a way, and this is key, hearing Karina wherever Tanagra fig figurines become known. In 1881, another author opined, quote, one of those Tanagra figurines I take to be Karina, nor can anybody help thinking of her when he notes the type common to all these images. It is as if the town and its character and its works molded itself instinctively after its supreme personage. She was its ideal. She will therefore be the inner creative principle of all its people are or do. For 19th century viewers then, to see a Tanagra figurine was to be in the presence of the poet herself. Now Jane, Jane's facsimile was made in the workshop of a man by, uh, by the name of Fritz Gerlitt, a German. In the workshop, a chief sculptor would analyze ancient figurines and conceive of the design for the facsimile. Then another artist would cast the facsimile in a mold, tool it by hand, and finally paint the decorative details. If we compare the facsimile of the original at the Hermitage to Jane Stanford's uh, uh, facsimile, we can see some differences. So you can see uh, in, in the original, Karina is weathered and gray, um, whereas in uh, Jane's facsimile, you have more of more vibrant sky blue, a fresher sun kiss, almost out of the earth terracotta, terracotta color. Now look at uh, the woman's lap. What do you see? Is this a laptop? No. Is it a book? Nope. It's actually a diptych 
or a writing tablet, which someone from Gerlitz workshop has re tried to restore to its proper position. You can see how it's not in uh, the Karina's hand in the original. And as a side note, what's interesting about this is even though Gerlitz uh, was trying to fix an error in the ancient figurine, uh, scientific analysis of this terracotta at the Hermitage reveals that even the ancient tablet, the clay dates to a different era as the original figurine. But this doesn't necessarily mean that uh, someone was trying, a, a modern person was trying to make this into a Karina statuette or something similar because the clay uh, also dates to antiquity. So perhaps there was some form of ancient uh, restoration work done. Uh, so the objects in this exhibition show us that a thirst for the authentic often seems driven by a desire to connect with past individuals, as if their presence had left a trace upon matter. An icon, uh, a miracle working icon blessed by the noble dead, or a ring inscribed with the name of a famous pharaoh, or Tanagra facsimiles that conjure the presence of the poet Corina, who is thought to be her town's ideal, and quote, the inner creative principle of all her people are or do. The facsimile may even bring about creative acts of restoration. It presents us with a view of antiquity, not as is currently constituted, but as it was imagined to be in the beginning, before time had effaced parts of its appearance into oblivion. We also see how an image's aura is subject to the flux of human perception and may even metamorphose over time. What seems to be genuine may one day be perceived as a fraud, as in the case of a relief of, a, of the warrior, or in the case of Stanford's mum, mummy coffin, the churn of history may transform an object from an artifact into an artifice, into an authentic hoax. Art often doesn't fit neatly into the categories that we invent or that we assign to it, such as fake or original. We might conclude, conclude then, as the film director Jim Jarmusch did in 2004, nothing is original, steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. Devour old films, new films, music, books, paintings, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, bodies of water, light and darkness. Select only things to steal from that speak directly to your soul. If you do, your work and theft will be authentic. Thank you. All right, I hope everyone can hear me uh, coming back. Uh, thank you, Eric, um, so much for this presentation. Um, and I just wanted to remind everyone, you can just send your questions uh, directly to me and I'll be going through them and uh, delivering some of them to Eric. Um, but if, if I could just sort of exploit my prerogative and <laughs> as the moderator and ask the first question, sort of a two-parter, um, but one I just, I, wanted to sort of invite you to say a little bit more, Eric, about sort of how, how you sort of stumbled into this, um, into this uh, project, um, how you sort of found these objects, um, uh, people sort of directed them to you, um, really how this came about. And uh, I guess the second part, which is related is, you know, I'm really struck by the way that, you know, you frame this in thinking about Benjamin's concept of aura, um, where, you know, he initially writes about it um, after his experience with hashish and whatnot, you know, and he's, he's thinking about, you know, what counts as experience in a technologically mediated culture. And, you know, the weird irony that we're here on Zoom, you know, <laughs> talking about the aura of these works. And so, you know, I, I really just kind of wanted to invite you also to sort of help, you know, guide the people who are listening to you think about I mean, hopefully we can all go see this show someday. It will be kind of open-ended um, to think a little bit more 
um, or say a little bit more about those the sort of the presence um, of these objects and sort of what you hope um, you know that people will take away from the show in person versus in this kind of uh, you know virtual mediated experience. Yeah, great, great question. So uh, this or the the seed of this idea started about five years ago, uh, around the time when I first got here. At that time, the mummy coffin of the Chantress of Amun was actually on the first floor in the gallery devoted to African art. And I remember seeing people go up to this, this mummy coffin and they would be sort of entranced by it, just kind of small crowds of people gathering around it, ooing and aahing, pulling out their phones, taking photographs. And then I would notice that they would, they would read the descriptive label next to the object and the photographs would stop, they would squint, they'd seem a bit disgruntled, and then they'd, they'd quickly rush off as if they'd somehow wasted their time. Mm -hmm. And years later, when, when the, the object, when the uh, mummy coffin had been moved to an audience, the difference was the museum label. Um, in the, in the, the prior version five years ago, uh, it was emphasized that 70 to 80% of the coffin's exterior had been worked on and, and changed to, to be a sort of modern vision of, of what, a, what, you know, a modern aesthetic of what a mummy coffin should look like. And uh, apparently this, this, this is what dispelled the aura or the sense of, of presence in this object. So, and I was struck by that, that maybe there could be a way that we could tell the full truth about the mummy coffin um, without dispelling the aura from the object. Great. Um, well, let me move on here. There's several questions. Um, I confess I've never virtually moderated <laughs> a presentation <laughs> before. Um, there's a really interesting question here from Todd, um, who's asking, um, how does authenticity um, as a concept and an idea vary depending on historical epoch? Um, aren't concerns about authenticity primarily a contemporary issue? Or should we see more historical diversity in the pre-modern eras? Yeah, that's, that is a very interesting uh, question. Um, so there, there are differences between modern understandings of authenticity uh, versus, versus ancient. Um, you know, uh, one person who came by here to look at a lot of the Egyptian antiquities in, in the Cantor's collection is a scholar and Egyptologist by the name of Sarah Cooney. And one of the things that she's been studying and, and she remarked about some of the objects in our collection is that in ancient Egypt, there wasn't this idea, kind of this binary idea of whether an object was true or false. Um, and coffins were often reused and reshaped even in antiquity. Uh, if, if you're, if um, I think it was during the second intermediate period, there was a shortage of wood and coffins in Egypt. So if you, uh, needed to make a coffin for your mother who had died, you may very well rob it in a sense from your grandmother. Um, mm. But that wasn't seen as in some way not being authentic or genuine to the tradition, even though the coffin was originally made for someone else. So I think there are similarities and differences. On the other hand, um, you know, uh, Patrick knows about this, uh, Greco-Roman writers, they were very interested and the notion of truth and painting. Um, and so this, that was a very important, significant issue. Hmm. Um, great, uh, follow-up question. Um, here, uh, next one here from uh, Alex Nemirov. Uh, are there forgeries of objects that Leland Stanford Jr. purportedly collected, um, that's to say fakes, of his own fakes? Uh, if not, what would it be like to commission an artist to make those fakes? 
what issues would that raise for you as curator, as writer? Wait, say that again. So if objects were purposefully commissioned as fakes? Is... Yes, are, are there forgeries of objects that Leland Stanford Jr. purportedly collected, that's to say fakes of his own fakes? If not, what would it be like to commission an artist to make those fakes? Hmm. I'm unaware of any objects that would fit in that category of fakes of fakes. Um, that's something definitely I'll, I'll have to think about. It's puzzling. Can I, uh, <laughs> since there's only two of us, can I, and, and you're the new, uh, You've got this new position at the Cantor. What would you? What are some of your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, so, so come here for as well. I mean, I, I would invite everybody who hasn't uh, already, although I imagine many people on this list have, to uh, check out the exhibition for the Melancholy Museum, which is um, still in there. I'm not aware of anything. Um, again, as I said, purported fakes that would be fakes of his own fakes. Um, but that's an intriguing place to start. Um, so, yeah, I'm gonna have to sort of put a pin in that. I, I, you know, from my sort of limited perspective at this point. Um, there definitely is more work that can be done in that area. Uh, mm -hmm. With the Stanford's collection, this, I mean, this is kind of the beginning of exploring questions about fakes and forgeries in this area. But I know that uh, there's an entire category of Mesopotamian or purportedly Mesopotamian artifacts um, that also could be explored. There's, there's more objects. So something could potentially turn up that is type of fake of a fake. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing it sort of gets to that's interesting is the kind of, I don't want to say fabrication, but a kind of mythos of Leland Stanford Jr.'s at the age of what? 13, 14, 15, at this time, I mean, what exactly is that um, the relationship? Or were people even showing him things that they knew uh, were fakes? Or, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's an interesting historical document, but there's so many more layers, I think, that one could, you know, potentially peel back. But, um, but in thinking about the sort of the mythos of Leland Stanford, um, I think his, the question is interesting to, to think about things that maybe were sort of, um, I mean, even the object of the warrior that, that you have, the relief, um, you know, from the first director of the, of the Cantor. Um, and so there are all sorts of things that I think, you know, were the sort of the early history of the museum that are a little bit murky where that could sort of come into view. Um, let, me, let me move on because we've got a lot of great questions. Um, okay. Um, so somebody asks, um, how does the idea of fakes and aura relate to restoration decisions for the objects in the exhibition? I'm thinking in particular of the Egyptian sarcophagus, which seems obviously to have been heavily modified, and yet you demonstrated that the modifications make it a valuable object for understanding 19th century interest in ancient Egypt. So in a case like that, one might be hesitant to quote unquote, restore it to its original state, since that would cause you to lose something of its history. How do issues like this inform the museum's decision whether or not to restore something closer to the quote unquote, original? That's a, that's a fantastic question. And I think that gets at the heart of what I'm trying to argue um, in the exhibition catalog and what I'm trying to put on display is there's so many objects that the mummy coffin in particular is a palimpsest of different eras. Mm. So at least to my mind, it would be a mistake to try to re restore it to some pristine original, um, particularly in that case, because it would be impossible uh, that the, the, the head has been cut back. So what you'd have to do in a sense is add a, another layer of like wood material onto the front of the coffin, which I think is different than simply stripping off paint and then adding, uh, you know, reconstructing it the way it originally would have been. Hmm. Um, great. Let's see. Uh, 
Uh, so Danny asks, uh, Eric, thanks so much for this presentation. I'm curious about the role of the museum and the mechanics of display in establishing aura. I'd be curious to hear from you. Um, does putting an object in a museum endow it with an aura or project an aura onto it? Thank, thank you, Danny, for asking that question. Absolutely. Um, I think that, um, well, well, as I was curating this exhibition, I would watch people as they would move through the galleries and watch the expressions on their faces. And there really is a sense of presence by taking something and putting it on display. It can be as humble as, for instance, there's one object um, that will be on display. It's just a humble textile. It's a simple cube shaped uh, object. And in English embroidered letters, it says 3000 year old cloth cut from the heart. And this is another object that Leland Stanford collected. Uh, it's a very pedestrian looking object, uh, but there are two things that would give it an aura. One is putting it on display and the other is that it, it purportedly was once on the heart of an ancient Egyptian mummy. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you for that question. Um, let me find another one here. Um, let's see. Um, okay, somebody asks this question, which is, this came up a couple times. Some of the Cantor Art Center's Rodin works were cast after the author's death. Are those considered authentic reproductions, something in between? Um, uh, if you want, I, if you have something to add, I can say something as well. Um, Go for it. Um, yeah, so there's actually, uh, there's one object in the collection uh, that came, uh, it's, it's a, a cast. Um, I should go back and say that the vast majority of the Cantor's uh, casts of Rodin are posthumous casts. Um, and uh, however, according to French law, Rodin's uh, estate was turned over uh, to the French government um, and that has a very specific kind of set of legal codes about how many of these uh, casts can be made um, and, uh, and so forth. So in the case of, of, of Rodin, the distinction, I mean, that's one case um, where the distinction between something that's a forgery or a copy or an original, I mean, all of these different categories is uh, kind of legally um, uh, determined in, in a lot of cases. Um, but there is one object in uh, the Cantor's collection and it's on display that was cast after something which is not one of those kind of sanctioned or authorized. Um, so that's an interesting case where for all intents and purposes, it's, it's cast from, you know, something uh, that is a Rodin, right? But it's not one of these legally sanctioned ones. So it's not an authorized copy. So um, that came up, came up in a couple of questions. Um, so I just thought I would um, put that there. Um, let's see. Uh, somebody asks, it seems that reproductions or false, false works lack some of the beauty of the originals or their compelling spirit. Are there cases where the inauthentic pieces are more aesthetically appealing or a true improvement as a work of art? Uh, so here, if can I share my screen? I could show an example where that is debatable. Sure. Okay. So, all right. So. If everybody can see this, this is one of the objects uh, that will be on display in the exhibition that we didn't talk about. Um, it's a necklace of 14 wedges strung together. And what's interesting, I would call this also an authentic hoax. What's interesting about it is the, these are the wedged eyes. And these, uh, were amulets that would be placed on um, a mummy's corpse over the breast covering. And there were a number of different amulets. It wasn't just the wedged eye, but these would be placed on the breast covering. Um, but what somebody has done in the 19th century is taken a bunch of these that 
would have existed probably on multiple different mummies and strung them together into a single uh, artistic vision of 19th century beauty. Um, this fits with the, the 19th century spirit of Egyptomania. Now, so the question is, does it look more aesthetically compelling as a necklace than the individual wedged eyes? That's a matter of debate, but I think that Jane Stanford, with her interest in jewelry, obviously found something very compelling in having an Egyptian necklace that was, um, she probably didn't discern that, she probably didn't know that it was uh, kind of like a quasi fake, an authentic hoax, genuine ancient objects brought mm -hmm. together um, into a, a new like 19th century work of art. Um, but clearly this was something that interested her and was um, compelling to her. Um, so I think that there can be examples where that happens, um, though um, as, as the person comments, it's often not the case. Like in the relief of the warrior, it's, it's, it's clearly like a substandard work of art. It's not the same, it's not done at the same level of craftsmanship as say an authentic Roman relief. Great. Um, let's see. Um, so Jacob asks, is there any difference between modern and ancient interpretations of the concept uh, of this concept of aura conveying presence? In other words, if I mount uh, artwork of the Christ today, um, is the sense of presence the same as it would be understood by ancient cultures? It's a great question. Uh, this is something that um, faculty, have, or this is, you know, a, a topic that uh, I can say Bisra Pentcheva has written a lot about here at Stanford, the concept of the aura and presence with medieval icons. And the answer is, is no, it, it varies from era to era. So something might be endowed with, today something might be endowed with presence because we hang it on a wall in a museum. But what I was trying to intimate slightly um, at the end talking about the Russian Orthodox icon is ritual would have been the means of, of creating this, this aura, as well as the, uh, the phenomenology of the experience of venerating an icon, having the candles lit and flickering on the golden um, ground of the icon. All of this would contribute to the sense of presence, which is, is very different than the way we see, um, for instance, in, in most intro to art history textbooks, we have images of, of uh, particular works of art and they're, they're done with modern photography to create a very like precise scientific um, look at the work of art, which is, which is different than say in, in Byzantium during uh, the sixth century. Great. Um, so Yi Chen asks, uh, since aura or authenticity uh, says more about the people doing the authenticating than the object, how would you describe your own role as the curator? Is it enough to just trouble these old labels and attributions, or do you have a stronger position against uh, or over authenticity? So. The position I see myself in, I don't see myself as uh, creating the last word on any of these objects. I hope that this continues a dialogue about uh, the authenticity of works of art in the Cantor's collection. One of my main aims was simply to help um, the public as, the, as they go through and they look at objects in the gallery to be able to see sort of the palimpsest of different layers of many of these objects. And to hopefully um, acknowledge the different, the different eras that can be layered together without dispelling the aura of a particular image. So in the future, we're hoping to do some more testing on some of these objects and, and that will reveal more. But in terms of whether my own interpretation is the last word, I, I don't think so. That, essentially is never the case in scholarship. We're always just moving line upon line, uh, one step at a time. 
Um, Francois asks, you've covered authentic hoaxes, copies, and facsimiles. What do you make of restorations and reconstructions, such as the reconstruction of the Dresden Frauenkirche, um, completed in the 1990s, or the ongoing reconstruction of uh, uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris? While the fire of Notre Dame was considered by the public at uh, at large as a loss, many other cathedrals and other edifices were extensively rebuilt, the reconstruction itself a mere footnote in the history of those buildings. Yeah, that's very interesting. It's a fascinating question, especially with architecture, because there's more uh, opportunity for there to be this multi-layered effect. And the question is a good one is, to what era are we to restore it, um, if that is even known? Uh, but I think in general, al although these decisions are difficult, um, uh, so one example that comes to mind um, that um, I'm familiar with is the Red Monastery in Egypt. It had um, essentially been overlooked and covered in soot and grime, all these paintings um, within the sanctuary of the monastery. Um, you know, from the Middle Ages until the 20th century, and it was only recently restored. And the question was, do we restore, um, do we restore the paintings back to their original or their earliest strata, or do we, or do we choose some other um, era? And in this case, they decided to leave. There was a there was a main there was a layer of paint that was left kind of so that there was a coherent visual program from the Middle Ages, but occasionally um, you almost see like these ghost images from earlier eras that they've allowed to come forward. So that's one possible way to go about doing something like that. Um, but it is a difficult decision. I certainly don't have the answer for all of those major buildings. I mean, that's something that some of the, the best minds and, and groups of minds are, are going to be thinking about. Um, also, uh, Alexandra clarified that he was asking not about things that were designed to be dupes, uh, to dupe the public, but rather new works. Um, so oh. if you have anything else to think about that, other, otherwise something to, for me at least, to ponder over, but I don't know if you have any other. That were new works of art. Okay. Um, hmm. I mean, so, hmm. One thing that comes to mind, I don't, this isn't Leland Stanford, but Jane's facsimiles, I mean, these are, they're facsimiles, but in many ways they, they do become, I guess I wouldn't go there, new works of art. So I'll have to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's a, there is a portrait of Leland Stanford that was commissioned as a new work of art. Uh, and it's sort of a, a type of deception as well. Uh, you see this, you see Leland Stanford on the top of this hill looking out over the Mediterranean and he, it, it's, it's very naturalistic. You get the impression that somebody was really there painting him. But as it turns out, uh, the whole thing is a fiction. It was, it was painted after his death. It's a posthumous portrait. And essentially there's, They've taken his form and copied and pasted, pasted mm. it into the painting. And then if you, if you look at the painting carefully enough, it matches a lot of the details of Herbert Nash's descriptions of Leland Stanford's, in fact, the very moment in the very hill he was thought to be sitting on when he first got sick, when he got typhoid, um, and that eventually led to his death. So that's an example of a modern work that was commissioned by the Stanfords as a type of loving lie, a type of fiction that used a deception to portray what they believed was the truth of their son's mm. um, final moments on earth. Great. Um, so I think one of the last questions we have here uh, from Peter, um, he says, he, was, he says, I was struck now more than before by the quote that says forgeries can be difficult to discern because they are made by the descendants of the original makers. 
what are we to make of this? Is it a, a sort of ethnic essentialism that doesn't really help our understanding? Well, that's a very interesting question. I think um, Wakeling's point there, you know, there probably is a little bit of that. Um, it is an early 19th, um, 20th century um, work, Forged Egyptian Antiquities. But I think his main point is that um, the practices of creating works of art have been passed down for generations. And the, the very exposure of people to, he's actually more, he's actually more generous in his portrayal than you might expect. Uh, Wakeling talks about, there's, there's a certain section where he's celebrating uh, a certain forger, I think from Thebes, who had become so skilled that he was actually better than, um, in many ways, than, than perhaps the, the ancient Egyptians at creating certain works of art. But yeah, no, I, I don't think that would be something we, this ethnic essentialism would be something we'd want to uh, promote. Great. Um, also, I have a note here. Um, if you, maybe you can stop sharing your screen just for um, a second. Yeah. That's easy. Great. There we go. Um, and I think just one last uh, question that just came up here. Um, have there been forgeries discovered in recent years among the Stanford collection? What is done with such an object? Would it be destroyed? I, so I, I wouldn't have the call on, the, on that decision. I, I don't think the object would be destroyed. Uh, Patrick, would you destroy the object? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, uh, no, um, I think it would be safe to say we would not destroy the object. Um, I think the thing that I mentioned earlier about um, the case of uh, this uh, cast hand in the Rodin gallery is actually a great um, case, even if it's a complicated case. Um, and also, for the most part, because rather than hiding it away, you know, in the uh, storage of the museum, it can actually serve, you know, kind of an educational function, right? It's out there, it has uh, quite a, you know, an extensive wall text next to it that sort of talks about, um, you know, what is, what is considered a, a forgery or a fake in relation to Rodin, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think that's really what you've showed really well here, you know, in this exhibition and part of your talk today is the, the sort of the educational value of these things, even if, they don't sort of exist in their sort of whatever sort of purity or totality, right, um, here. And so I think, um, I think that's really valuable. Um, and rather than thinking of them as necessarily compromised in some way, I think that especially in the context of a university museum, um, especially, there's a way to sort of leverage these cases, as you've shown, to, you know, in ways to really think about you know, where do we put the value? How do we tell the story? Where do these things go? Um, you know, and, and hiding them away in the collection isn't, isn't um, uh, you know, in, in storage also isn't um, the answer. And so I think um, that's, that's a great value. Um, Absolutely. And can I add one other point? I'm just noticing the other part to this question, which says, ha have there been forgeries discovered in recent years? I, I should emphasize that a lot of the objects um, that you can find online for this exhibition and that eventually you'll be able to see live in the gallery spaces, that's exactly what they are. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of the ring, that, that was something that was a new discovery from the Stanford's collection, uh, the, the necklaces. So I think that's one of the major, I guess, intellectual contributions to the Cantor's collection is discovering um, many of these objects in the Stanford's collection that that are forgeries or quasi forgeries, um, authentic hoaxes, these sorts of things. Yeah. Great. Well, I think we're almost at an hour anyway. Um, and I think we've exhausted most of the questions that I find. I hope that I didn't um, uh, miss anything. But um, in any case, um, I wanted to thank you uh, again, Eric, uh, for uh, this presentation. Um, for everybody, uh, we still have uh, quite a lot of people here. It was a really good turnout. Um, um, thank everyone for joining us. And um, 
whenever we are allowed back into the museum, uh, Eric's exhibition is designed to be part of an ongoing uh, uh, um, exhibition in part of uh, the gallery. So um, it is our full hope and expectation that everyone, um, at whatever point it's possible, will be able to come and um, and see the show in its full um, erratic presence. So um, thank you again, Eric, and um, thanks again to all of you. And uh, we will sign off. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Thank thanks. you, everyone.